This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. Here at DerbyCon 2011 with Brad here from Level 1 Hackerspace. How are you, Brad? I'm doing great. So tell me about your guys' hackerspace. Uh, well, we've got a 2,000 square foot warehouse in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we've got about 36 members in our hackerspace, and we've been around for oh, a little over a year now. I, I got to say, the whole movement has just blown up in these last couple of years. What, what really inspired you? Uh, well, I found out about these guys on the internet after they had already started meeting in bars and coffee shops, and I just met up with them, and they're all really cool guys. So I started hanging out, and uh, I've been been with them ever since. Nice. Well, tell me about your project, because this looks wicked. Well, what I've got here is uh, a demo model of our transatlantic balloon payload. We're trying to become the first amateur group to cross the Atlantic Ocean with an unmanned robotic balloon. Uh, so here is the, the demo model. It's stripped down so you can see all the guts on the inside. We've had to design everything from flight controllers and, and ballast uh, ballast controllers to cryogenic chambers to test all our stuff in. We've got lots of software on the back end to test everything. We've run mission control simulations. So Okay, i got to say, first off, the FAA, they're probably not going to like this. Uh, we are actually an exempt balloon by uh, FAR 101 regulations. Uh, I'm not familiar. Explain to me. Uh, so NOAA launches lots and lots of weather balloons all the time, every day. And this is in the same category as a weather balloon, even though it behaves a little bit differently. So we fall in that same category. Uh, but we still want to be responsible. You know, we don't want to be uh, hackers that are menaces in the sky. You're not going to packet sniff across the Atlantic? What if you find a really cool access point somewhere in the middle of the ocean? We're flying. We've already spent enough money just trying to get it there. So, uh, But we are going to try and be safe about this whole thing. So we are going to be talking to air traffic control the whole time, letting them know where we are, where we're going, and anything else they want to know. We also have control over this balloon so we can actually abort our mission and cut it out of the sky if we need to. How do you get access to it? I mean, how are you talking to it? Uh, we're talking to it with a satellite link the whole time it's in the sky. You guys have a satellite link? How do you, how do you swing that? Uh, well, there are commercial satellite networks out there that for a, uh, for a small fee will give you some, some, a few kilobytes of data that you can transmit from anywhere in the world. And, and how do you go about transmitting it? Uh, I mean, is this like running Linux? Is it standard modem? How does that work? Uh, well, it's actually all 8-bit microcontrollers, uh, Ar Arduinos, honestly. We've got like five Arduinos on this thing, and one of them is controlling the satellite modem. And the satellite modem just talks uh, a weird binary serial protocol, and if we talk to it in a language that it likes, it'll uplink that data to the satellite network, and then the balloon will actually email us. It'll send us an email that we can then read and decode the data and figure out where it is. That is that's wicked. That sounds expensive, too. Uh, it is. It is if you have to go through... Uh, if you have to, if you have to go through uh, commercial channels, but uh, if you just buy the parts, our satellite modem is only $150 each as a part, and then we can develop on top of that. And uh, the satellite networks, uh, we've actually had to take great lengths to reduce our data consumption. Uh, at our rate, it's not going to be that expensive at all. So, what kind of telemetry are you going to be getting back? Uh, in addition to things like position and speed, where it's going, where it's been, and uh, diagnostic information from the inside, we're also collecting scientific information, such as external temperature and humidity. Uh, we've got a cloud sensor on here to detect whether or not we've blown into a cloud. So if we fall out of the sky, we know whether it's because of ice in the atmosphere. We've also got uh, a helium temperature sensor in the very top of our balloon, which is really important because no one has collected this data on a balloon like ours before, not even NASA. Wow, that's really intriguing. How? Okay, so I get that the idea is to cross the pond. Uh, how do you change like your your altitude and things like that? I'm, I'm, these are probably really newbie questions, but you know, as a hacker and not a balloon engineer or something, how does that all work? Uh, well. Eventually, what, come, what goes up must come down. So we, we drift down over a period of, of many days, uh, but we've got ballast on here, so we can drop ballast and then head back up. Uh, but we are limited by the amount of ballast that we have, so once we run out of ballast, it's all down. Is there like a limit to the size of the payload that you can launch and still be under the criteria of this FAA regulation? Yes, we are limited to 12 pounds of payload. Okay, so I guess I understand why it's uh, with all these little microcontrollers and Arduinos, it needs to be really, really light, so you can put your 12 pounds or as much of it as possible into the into the ballast, so you can stay up for as long as possible. How uh, do you, how do you know where you're going to go? It's not like you've got a engine on this thing with propellers or anything, and even if you did, not like you could really go anywhere. Uh, how um, how do you how do you how do you have any idea where you're going to land? 
Well, the government fortunately releases global wind data sets like every four hours. So we just use government provided tools to run the data and it'll tell us exactly where we're going to go. So we just run those models until it ends up that we can let it go and it'll be in Europe somewhere. Somewhere in Europe. And so you just kind of have an idea of like when, like what time of day to launch it or something like that? Yep, we've got, well, we, we all have day jobs, so we're only looking at launch opportunities that are that are in the evening. Um, so we, we look at launch opportunities in the evening, and we get about a week's notice before we're able to launch. Oh, that's really cool. So uh, I got to ask, will people be able to follow this on, like, Twitter and other social media and stuff like that? Absolutely. We've got a Twitter feed, uh, LVL1 White Star. Uh, we've also got our own website is whitestarballoon.com. Uh, and th when you go there, you can sign up for a mailing list to get announcements when we're going to launch. And when we do launch, you'll be able to track it live across the ocean. We've got an application that'll show you the line of where it's going and where we think it'll and, and where we think it'll be, and and it'll also tell you all our telemetry values live. Yeah. And and then some hackerspace in France is all like, hey, we retrieved your balloon. We're going to send it back around the other way. <laughs> Absolutely, that would be great. And actually, once we achieve the goal of uh, transatlantic, we're going to work on the goal of global circumnavigation. Wow, are you going to go around the world in 80 days or something? <laughs> Hopefully, it won't take 80 days, uh, but it sure it, it will sure take uh, a lot longer than that to build the the next model. What an elegant way to go around the world by balloon! I'm truly fascinated. Any time I meet anybody from the hacker spaces, it's just amazing the kinds of creative project hackers always come up with. Thank you so much. I hope that you inspire like kids at home that are just thinking about getting into this stuff. Where can they find out about the uh, the hackerspace? Uh, well, our hackerspace is the Level 1 Hackerspace in Louisville, Kentucky, and they can find out about it at lvl1.org. Thank you so much, Brad. There are two things IT professionals and their clients have in common. They want the job done right and they want it done fast. And that's why I highly recommend go to Assist Express by Citrix for anyone in IT. It's got the fastest, most reliable support. Go to Assist Express puts clients at ease with a simple, secure remote support. And it puts you in a position to do what you do best. Access, diagnose, and resolve the problem. With the fastest support experience and the ability to service multiple clients at once, you'll actually be increasing revenue while improving your customer service reputation. Take care of clients while they're away with the unattended support feature and get unlimited use for one flat fee. When it comes to remote support tools, I think GoToAssist Express is the best. So fast, so reliable, don't wait. Start using GoToAssist Express today. Hack5 viewers can try it free for 30 days. Go to gotoassist.com slash H-A-K-5. Again, that's gotoassist.com slash hack5 for a free trial. It is time once again for the nibble and this week it was sent in by Anonymous, not that Anonymous, who writes, that this is an awesome way to download and extract archives without having to permanently store that .tar.gz file, which you don't really need, you just need what's inside of it. So check this out, wget, tac, capital O, space, tac, space, and then your URL. In this case, I'm getting stuff.tar.gz. And then we go ahead and pipe that into tar, zxvf, space, tac. There we go, resolving our domain. And voila, it is downloading and extracting at the same time, and we don't have to keep the tar.gz. How awesome is that? If you've got a nibble, go ahead and send it over to us at hack5.org slash nibble. Get yourself some free swag while you're at it.